Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar commemorating the 50th anniversary of the February 9th, 1971 San Fernando, California earthquake. I should mention at the outset that this webinar is being recorded. My name is Jonathan Stewart. I am a faculty member in the UCLA Samueli School of Engineering, which is celebrating its own anniversary this year, 75 years. I am on the executive committee of a conference being jointly organized by the ASC Infrastructure Resilience Division and UCLA Engineering. This conference, which we call Lifelines 2021, was originally to occur this week on the 50th anniversary of the earthquake. As a result of COVID-19, we've postponed the conference to February 2022 as a full and hopefully in-person event. We view this webinar as the launch of our conference activities, holding to the anniversary of the, of the event. Events like this will continue through 2021, that is webinars leading up to the in-person conference in 2022. We encourage you to visit the Lifeline 2021 website where you'll be able to access a video of this event, the itinerary of our future events, a conference book of abstracts and other resources. Now, we are delighted that you have joined us for this webinar. We have an outstanding program for you that honors, that honors the anniversary of the event as well as its technical and policy legacies. I would like to begin our webinar with a message from City of Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti. Good morning, Los Angeles. I'm Mayor Eric Garcetti, and it's my honor to help kick off ASCE and UCLA's San Fernando Earthquake Conference. The past year has been incredibly difficult for all of us, unprecedented in so many ways. But Los Angeles is a resilient city that knows how to emerge stronger from a shock or a crisis. In fact, that's what we did after the 1971 San Fernando or Silmar earthquake which resulted in over $500 million in property damage and tragically, 65 deaths. That experience reminded us why being ready isn't a choice for us. It's a necessity, a matter of life and death. The city of LA, along with partners like UCLA's Samuel Lee School of Engineering, the American Society of Civil Engineers, and the US Geological Service, we made changes to our building codes, emergency plans, and preparedness programs. And five decades later, we know it's not a matter of if there will be another major earthquake, but when. That's why, soon after becoming mayor, I enlisted seismologist Dr. Lucy Jones to help guide our earthquake plans. With our partners, we created an early earthquake warning system that has been adopted statewide. We focused on seismic retrofit programs for buildings, water conveyance systems, and telecommunication infrastructure. We've done so much, including vastly expanding our emergency preparedness programming to ensure that families and neighborhoods and our business community are more prepared to respond in a crisis and more aware of how to help one another. Our city is safer now because of what we learned on that tragic day in 1971. And I'm grateful to ASCE and UCLA for organizing this remembrance and conference. Together, we'll keep working to make our city better prepared to weather and recover from the next major shock. And together, we'll build a more resilient Los Angeles. I was born two weeks before the Silmar earthquake, so we're both turning 50 this year. And from that golden anniversary, let us all learn the lessons to truly make Los Angeles safe for generations to come. Good morning, Los Angeles. I'm Mayor Eric Garcetti. Thank you, Mayor Garcetti. The mayor's initiatives have made Los Angeles a leader nationally and internationally in the development and implementation of public policy that advances seismic resilience. And we are grateful for his leadership. Our lineup today includes Dean Jayathi Murthy, and Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Emily Carter from UCLA, three distinguished guests who will speak on different aspects of the 1971 event and whom I'll introduce shortly, 
and a moderated QA session at the end of the hour. Before proceeding to our next presentation, let me take a moment to thank all of our Lifelines 2021 sponsors, and especially the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, who were very helpful in organizing and planning this event. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce the first female dean of the Samueli Engineering School at UCLA, the Ronald and Valerie Sugar Dean of Engineering, Jayathi Murthy. Thank you, John. Um, and welcome everybody. Drop, cover, hold on, get to the field. Well, the first three commands are what every one of us is trained to follow when we feel an earthquake. The last one, well, that's the instinct of many of our participants and speakers today. Get to where the shaking is most intense and where the damage is most devastating. I don't envy earthquake engineers and scientists, but we're all indebted to them. Minutes after the shaking subsided on the morning of February 9th, 1971, UCLA civil engineering professor C. Martin Duke was on the phone to officials in Washington, getting the go ahead to conduct a massive post event reconnaissance of what and where suffered damage and why. The ultra detailed report also for the first time highlighted that lifelines, the critical arteries that deliver our water, energy, information and more are particularly vulnerable in a strong earthquake. Uh, along with Martin Duke, another UCLA civil engineering professor, Kenneth Lee also did seminal work to help us understand what caused the near failure of the lower San Fernando Dam. Uh, Professor Lee was a geotechnical engineer specialized in soil mechanics, liquefaction, and their effects on structures. Uh, their pioneering efforts in the field are a big reason why we're here today, marking the 50th anniversary of the San Fernando earthquake with this virtual symposium, as we look forward to the larger ASCE Lifelines Conference next February, when we can all gather again in person. Before we continue, I want to touch on some of the ongoing research efforts here at UCLA Samuli. The Garrick Institute of Risk Sciences, led by Professor Ali Mosley, has been doing critical work to help us understand and better prepare for the many natural and man-made hazards that threaten society, including earthquakes. And within the Garrick Institute, the National Hazards Risk and Resiliency Research Center brings together experts from several research institutions all looking to reduce the risks of has, risks and hazards, uh, uh, to reduce the risk of hazards becoming full-blown disasters. The center is led by civil and, civil and environmental engineering professor Yusuf Bozornia, who I know many of you in the earthquake engineering community know well. Uh, and of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the phenomenal research on seismic resilience by our civil and environmental engineering faculty led by uh, Chair Ertegrul Tassaroglu, uh, ET as he's known to his friends, and also his colleagues, uh, John Stewart, Henry Burton, and many others uh, who collaborate with industry partners such as LADWP, uh, the California Geological Survey, uh, to help us fortify our critical lifelines against the next big one. Uh, I'm grateful for their leadership and for all the participants who are here today. Uh, and now, it is my honor to welcome and introduce Dr. Emily Carter, UCLA's Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, and a Distinguished Professor in Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Emily. Thank you, Jayathi. Uh, and hello, everyone. Today's event is relevant to each of the three pillars of UCLA's mission, research, teaching, and public service. The service pillar may sometimes feel less tangible than the other two, but it's central to what animates us as a campus community and what we stand for as a public institution. And it's what I'd like to talk about with you briefly today. UCLA's public service charge shapes our educational and research enterprise. It, hel it has helped embed our institution into the civic, cultural, and economic life of Southern California, and it underpins our efforts to, under to address major societal challenges here and indeed around the world. For example, 
Our commitment to public service compels us to take a leadership position in the fight against COVID-19, to test, to treat, and to vaccinate thousands across our region. It is also the driving force behind our Sustainable LA Grand Challenge, which aims to use UCLA expertise to transform Los Angeles uh, in, in cons consultation and in partnership with community partners into the world's most sustainable megacity by 2050, making it the most livable, equitable, resilient, clean and healthy megacity and an exemplar for the world. Public service is also behind our de depression grand challenge, which is advancing our understanding of the causes of and treatments of mental illness with the hope that we can cut the burden of depression in half by 2050. And of course, our public service mission undergirds our efforts to understand the science of earthquakes and to develop greater societal resilience in the face of natural disasters more generally. UCLA faculty and students are studying and advising industry and government leaders on issues that range from soil liquefaction, like we heard about uh, a, a moment ago, to seismic risk, to how critical infrastructure like buildings, bridges, water delivery systems, and gas lines will perform during a major earthquake. This work will improve our region's preparation, help us respond when faced with an actual emergency, and undoubtedly save lives. Our work on these issues goes beyond research projects, beyond the education we provide in engineering and in other disciplines, and even beyond, definitely also beyond the nearly $3 billion that UCLA has invested in seismic retrofitting our own campus uh, in recent decades. It extends to acting as a convener like today, bringing together academics, planners, policymakers, and others to think about, collaborate, and prepare together. To that end, we're proud to join the, the ASCE Infrastructure Resilience Division in organizing next year's Lifelines Conference, which will use an interdisciplinary lens to examine and propose improvements to our regional infrastructure systems. I encourage you to join us next February. And in the meantime, I hope that today's program will provide useful insights and perspectives that will inform your studies and the work in the year ahead. Thank you and enjoy the sessions. Thank you, EVCP Carter. Now we will transition to our main program. We welcome your questions for the speakers. You can enter them at any time using the QA button accessible at the bottom of the screen. We will begin with Steve Cole, Manager of Water System Project Engineering at the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Steve. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Uh, unfortunately, our general manager, Marty Adams, wasn't able to make it today at the last minute. He had a, uh, an emergency situation come up. So I, my name is Steve Cole, and I'm with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And I just really thank everybody for uh, joining us on this um, virtual commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Silmar earthquake. Uh, it's, it's always good, in my opinion, to, to look at the past to inform kind of what we do in the present and for the future. And so to, to do that, I'd like to first start out with a video. It will help us to visualize what occurred back in 1971 and demonstrate some magnitude and impacts the Silmar earthquake had on our region. So with that, let's uh, please take a look at the video here. <laughs> On February 9, 1971, at 6 a.m., a magnitude 6.6 .6 earthquake struck the northern San Fernando Valley that centered north of Silmar, California. The San Fernando earthquake, also known as the Silmar earthquake, caused major damage throughout the city of Los Angeles and surrounding areas. Critical infrastructure systems of all types were severely impacted, including LA's water and power systems. Probably the biggest newsmaker of the day was the Lower San Fernando Dam. It literally slumped about 30 feet down. Likewise, on the power side, most significantly was our Silmar Converter Station. That station had just been completed in 1970 and uh, was virtually destroyed in the earthquake and we lost that supply of energy coming in from the Pacific Northwest. What we learned from the earthquake represents a critical turning point in the field of earthquake engineering and seismology. 
At UCLA Samueli School of Engineering, our graduate and undergraduate curricula are affected and continuously revised by our research activities. As we have quite a number of research projects on earthquake engineering funded by state and federal agencies, uh, we provide ample opportunities for our graduate and undergraduate students alike to achieve the depth as well as breadth in topics related to earthquake engineering. So over the past 50 years, a lot of important work has been done to reduce the risk of these infrastructure systems to earthquakes. This includes um, replacing the vulnerable components to withstand effects across the city and improving preparedness capabilities. And at present, we're now working on how to significantly improve the resilience of these infrastructure systems so that we can return services to the customers as soon as possible after any devastating event. The 50th anniversary of the San Fernando earthquake is an opportunity to acknowledge the threats that earthquakes and other natural disasters pose to our critical infrastructure systems and rededicate ourselves to the task of enhancing resilience. What we're trying to do is change the course of history in the future. We can't stop earthquakes from ha happening and there will be more earthquakes. But what happens to the system, what happens to the water and power delivery and providing for the citizens of Los Angeles, we can change that course. While earthquakes are a reality of life in California, the continued partnership between LEDWP and institutions like UCLA and the American Society of Civil Engineers is essential to creating resilient infrastructure, to creating resilient communities, and to building a stronger LA. All right. Well, hopefully you guys enjoyed that uh, the video segment and also give you an opportunity to meet our general manager at Water and Power, Mr. Marty Adams, who uh, narrated that video. So we're going to go ahead. We're going to get started with a uh, little PowerPoint presentation here. Great. Uh, just wanted to commemorate this. We'll move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. There we go. OK, so these are some of the headlines that came out LA Times. Back in February 9th, 1971, 6 a.m., actually 6 a.m. almost precisely, a magnitude 6.5 earthquake struck the North San Fernando Valley. At the time, the population of Los Angeles was about uh, 2.8 million people. Uh, the epicenter was in Santa Clarita Valley. Uh, there was a lot of extensive surface faulting uh, to the south of the epicenter in the mountains, as well as in the urban settings along uh, city streets and neighborhoods. And at this time, uh, our, our general manager, Marty Adams, was actually living in the valley uh, as a nine-year-old boy. And uh, I remember him talking to me about uh, his, his experience with it being jolted out of bed uh, and, and realizing all the uh, impacts that went on and watching the, the situation unfold on TV. Next slide, please. So some of this, these are some of the dramatic pictures from the uh, 1971 earthquake. Uh, the photograph on the left is our uh, Lower San Fernando Dam, and uh, there was tremendous amount of uh, infrastructure damage, both the water side and power side. I'm going to talk first a little bit about the the power uh, the water side. Uh, we saw our first and second LA aqueducts damaged. Uh, as I mentioned, the the upper and lower San Fernando dams were also severely damaged. Uh, there was a fear of imminent collapse with this particular one that you see here on the left. Uh, it was holding back about a little over three and a half billion gallons at the time. Uh, luckily, uh, the reservoir was a little bit lower, so that helped help things out. But around 80,000 residents were evacuated. So extensive evacuation took place. And uh, the LADWP Van Norman complex where this reservoir sits is essentially the terminus for our first and second LA aqueducts. And it's also a power system inner tie for the uh, power coming from uh, the Pacific Northwest, from Bonneville Dam, uh, the Pacific in, uh, DC Intertie, and uh, all of that was severely damaged. Also, our water distribution uh, pipeline network had, had at least 800 leaks, possibly over 1,000 leaks, uh, so a lot of extensive damage within the distribution network itself. Next slide, please. So this, we kind of want to focus on, on uh, uh, the upper and lower San Fernando dams and, and primarily the lower San Fernando dam, but we'll talk a little about upper. The upper San Fernando dam slid downstream about five feet and settled about three feet vertically. And uh, a lot of that was uh, due to liquefaction, uh, the shaking of the ground and then the liquefying of the soils. One of the outlet towers collapsed into the reservoir for the, the near the lower San Fernando dam. 
uh, and there was a lot of damage to the outlet line and spillway on that reservoir. And the lower San Fernando Dam had uh, the most movement, the most dramatic movement. It was slid uh, up to 200 feet horizontally and dropped about 30 feet vertically. Uh, very significant. Luckily, we had about five feet of freeboard left, uh, which kind of saved the day. But you can see some of the dramatic photos. The one in the middle is uh, is uh, pretty dramatic because you can see the uh, uh, the, the last bit of uh, soil there uh, preventing the water from overtopping the uh, the dam. Uh, next slide, please. These photos kind of show some of our uh, a little bit of the damage within our system. On the uh, left hand side are uh, crushed valves from uh, what we call air vacuum valves, which are pertinences that remove and uh, uh, remove air from pipes and also allow air to be introduced to prevent vacuum. And uh, you can see they've been crushed. Normally they're in a ball type shape and uh, they were crushed by tremendous pressure surges as the water was going back and forth within the pipeline. Uh, you can also see on the uh, far right hand side, what we call our trunk lines, which are our large diameter pipelines. Uh, there was a lot of uh, collapse of these at uh, the welded joints or connections, uh, and these, these pipes would fold up uh, due to uh, compression or, or pull apart in some cases too. Uh, so we had quite a bit of damage. The other things that aren't shown on here are uh, water storage tanks, pump stations. We had a lot of damage to those. Um, a lot of damage from liquefaction again out in the street. And uh, uh, challenges with water supply and uh, being able to move water around. And uh, also the prohibition of being able to lower the reservoir surface elevation if uh, uh, pipelines get destroyed or broken or valves get damaged. Uh, it made it hard to reduce the amount of water behind those uh, uh, damaged dams. Also, we had chemical storage tanks that were uh, damaged and, um, and that was about it. Next slide, please. On the power system side, as I mentioned, we have the uh, uh, Pacific DC intertie, which terminates at our Silmar converter station. These are photographs of the Silmar converter station. And you can see the things that uh, basically uh, various components and equipment were uh, broken apart, thrown to the ground, uh, and, and it, it was it was a, it's an 846 mile overhead transmission line bringing power from the Pacific Northwest. Like as I mentioned earlier, from Bonneville Dam uh, was completed. This particular station was actually completed in 1970, one year before the earthquake, uh, and the earthquake obviously uh, almost completely devastated the the new station. Uh, power lines also went down. Other power infrastructure was severely damaged. And uh, it took about two and a half years to complete the reconstruction on the station, put it back in operation. Uh, there were also significant design changes that were made after this earthquake and also after the uh, Northridge earthquake uh, regarding seismic movement considerations, uh, using improved materials and design standards such as soft connectors instead of rigid connectors. Uh, next slide, please. So lessons learned and improvements. This is us engineers. We also like to uh, learn from everything. Uh, each, each experience brings, brings new learning lessons. And uh, some of the things that we learned uh, in conjunction with the USGS the, or US Geological Survey, LADDP initiated the development of a resiliency program in 2014 in order to strengthen water infrastructure and supplies in the event of an emergency or natural disaster. Uh, we also uh, worked with the, uh, the Japanese and we imported uh, some earthquake resistant ductile iron pipe uh, from Japan. And uh, it's a really high tech pipe, very innovative segmented design, allows a lot of flexibility, both uh, laterally and uh, axially at the joints, allows for a lot of rotation uh, to withstand the, the stress and strains associated with earthquakes, landslides, temperature changes, et cetera. And uh, we, we saw that there was some good results in Japan and we were able to bring that over here to the United States. And DWP is continuing to install that ERDIP pipe as part of a seismic resilient backbone system throughout the city. We're targeting critical earthquake locations and then trying to connect up uh, critical facilities such as hospitals, et cetera, to keep them, uh, uh, provide them water during an earthquake. And we're also piloting a program for additional sensors installed at dams trying to gather more real-time data and updates to understand issues immediately following an earthquake and uh, have, have greater insight into what, what our dams are doing. Uh, next slide, please. 
So continuing on the lessons learned side for the power system, uh, DWPs work to maintain reliability by evaluating and prioritizing maintenance and replacing aging and critical infrastructure throughout the power system reliability program. Silmar converter station improvements were designed to include articulated joints and springs. Uh, we also changed out some of the disconnect switches to extra high strength insulators with new seismic requirements at all of our um, remaining receiving stations and switching stations. We also do have a program to inspect uh, power equipment for uh, repairs, and that ranges from a broken cross arm to an abnormal circuit. And then in July 2018, LADDP completed construction of the Scattergood Olympic cable, which is a 230, 230 kilovolt, 11 and a half mile underground transmission line. It's one of the longest underground transmission lines in the department's power system. And this new line serves as a backup to the original 1974 transmission line. And we're applicable, uh, we've got transmission towers that are being retrofitted with hold down damping springs and several receiving stations. Also, uh, the transformer pads are being rebuilt. The newer standards have uh, uh, rely on uh, thicker pads, larger pads uh, to provide support for the equipment. Next slide, please. Regarding emergency preparedness, this is something we, we all know that we're gonna get an earthquake in, in California. So this is a question of when and trying to be prepared. Uh, as an important part of this, we have a uh, emergency response plan that we maintain we regularly conduct training and drills where we partner with other city and regional agencies, such as LA Police Department, city and county fire departments. Uh, we also work uh, at monitoring our dams using our experienced personnel in-house, gathering and analyzing our well data and using remote electronic technology to continue to monitor the, monitor the dams. The scope of work performed on our dams is validated by third-party experts who specialize in the fields of geology, dam engineering, and geotechnical engineering. And we are also under the oversight of the state's Division of Safety of Dams. And in the past several years, or several decades actually, our 35 dams and reservoirs have been judged safe for continued use by DSOD. Next slide, please. Collaboration, this is where we're all at today. And uh, this is kind of why we're all here together, which I think is awesome. Uh, important partnerships and collaboration with institutes such as UCLA, Delaware University, Cornell University, and others. Uh, our collaboration with UCLA Samuel I School of Engineering with the research projects is an important component for us to continue to improve infrastructure and understand earthquake engineering. We've got some great collaboration with Cornell University and University of Delaware doing earthquake resiliency studies. And we also have collaboration with manufacturers of earthquake resistant products, such as the Kubota Corporation in Japan. Uh, we collaborate with ASCE, who's uh, essential, essential, essential for sharing information and for furthering our understanding of earthquake engineering. We work very closely with our regulator to make sure our dams are safe. And at DWP, we're continuing to look at understanding new materials, early detection systems, new technology on both the water and power side. And our goal is to make Los Angeles earthquake resilient. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Next slide. That's it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Next, we will hear from Dr. Steve Bolin. Steve is the acting state geologist and head of the California Geological Survey. Steve. Thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you for inviting me to uh, this webinar. If I could have the slides, please. The San Fernando earthquake was uh, a, a literal and figurative wake up call for uh, California and really uh, for um, many towns and cities uh, in the Western US and, and around the world. Um, and today I want to present um, sort of the, the summary of all the actions that were taken to make Californians safer uh, from earthquakes. Uh, one of the remarkable outcomes of this earthquake was that there was actually quite rapid action, both at the state and federal levels in, in, in doing all of the things that are necessary to make 
Californians safer, to understand earthquakes better, and to then have uh, that understanding work its way back into uniform building code, seismic safety provisions, and, and other, uh, other requirements that, that make buildings safer, stronger, and more resistant to earthquakes. Next slide, please. So it was, uh, it was a rude awakening and on uh, this morning, uh, 50 years ago. Um, one of the interesting aspects of this earthquake was is that it, the, the length of the duration of shaking was not that long. Uh, Loma Prieta earthquake in the Bay Area in 1989 was slightly larger uh, and the uh, shaking lasted for uh, twice the amount of time. Uh, 50,000, uh, uh, 65,000 fatalities and a couple thousand injured. In 2021 dollars, roughly $2.3 billion worth of property damage. And as you've already heard um, from Steve Cole, uh, 80,000 people were evacuated as a result of uh, the near collapse of, of the, uh, the Newman Dam. Next slide, please. So what, what did California do in response to this? Well, it took several legislative actions. One of the first was the Hospital Safety Act. Uh, you can see on the upper left, uh, parts of the VA hospital in the area simply collapsed. In fact, 49 of the 65 fatalities were at this hospital uh, and the result of the collapsing structure itself. Uh, Another hospital, the Olive View Hospital, uh, big sections of the building um, were unstable and, and separated and, and fell and collapsed as well. And as you can see, the first floor in the lower left um, underwent extensive damage. There was the recognition that hospitals couldn't function under these conditions. And so they had to make hospitals uh, safer. So the Hospital Safety Act was born to ensure that hospitals could function uh, during and after an earthquake. And this was passed in 1974. Uh, this was modeled after the FIELD Act. The FIELD Act was uh, legislation enacted following the Long Beach earthquake in 1933. And the observation from that earthquake was is that unreinforced uh, school buildings were death traps and had that earthquake occurred at a, at a different time of the day when the schools were occupied, the number of fatalities would have been extremely large. And it turns out that in the San Fernando quake, schools that were built since, built to the standards required by the FIELD Act, actually all survived the earthquake and, and were, were capable of functioning. So the Hospital Safety Act was the result uh, of really of, of following uh, lessons learned from the uh, from previous earthquake, Long Beach earthquake, uh, with respect to schools. Next slide, please. The next piece of legislation that this earthquake inspired was the Alquist Priello Earthquake Fault Zone Mapping Act. Uh, there was clear recognition that st all structures uh, that were built on uh, ground that either um, liquefied or simply was were ruptured, had surface rupture from the, uh, from the movement of the earth itself, uh, suffered severe, if not catastrophic damage. And so um, the Alquist Priello Earthquake Fault Zone Mapping Act um, gave the assignment to the California Geological Survey to create earthquake uh, zones of active uh, earthquake um, faulting and, and also to identify faults that are, um, have been active recently, less than 12,000 years. Um, the Seismic Hazard Act of 1990 uh, went a little bit further um, and, and created uh, se seismic hazard zones. And these are zones in which uh, additional uh, work and careful study has to be done 
for construction to be placed within or near these zones. This uh, act was passed in 1972. So uh, for, for, uh, um, for government, that was, that was lightning speed. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, yeah, the, these are the some of the requirements uh, of the Alquist Priolo fault zone uh, evaluation and zoning. Uh, it, it actually defines what an active fault is um, and, and, and various aspects. And you can find uh, details information at, at the uh, CGS special publication 42. This is, is something of the Bible of, of uh, the um, fault zone mapping act. Next slide, please. Another piece of legislation initiated the California Strong Motion Instrumentation Program. Uh, this is a network, a very robust network of seismometers and accelerometers that are now throughout the state, literally thousands of, of sensors. But uh, the information available from, at the time of the San Fernando quake was really quite limited. Universities had networks of seismometers, uh, some privately funded, but there was no robust statewide network as there is now um, uh, to, to do all of the things that need to be done, both to understand what happened, understand, um, the amount of ground shaking uh, as a distance from the fault uh, and other scientific parameters that help engineers uh, engineer structures to be more resilient. The Strong Motion Instrumentation Program is a facility that is uh, operated by the California Geological Survey in partnership with uh, the uh, US Geological Survey and our academic partners at UC Berkeley and Caltech. Together, those four partners form the California Integrated Seismic Network. This is a very robust network of seismometers that provide information and, and also scientific data of how the ground is shaking outside and inside structures as we have bridges, various kinds of buildings uh, and various infrastructure dams and so forth instrumented so that there is a detailed understanding of the dissipation of seismic energy in structures by comparing what happens inside a structure with what happens in what's called the free field or the area around the structure um, in, in unbuilt uh, areas. Uh, as you can see here on the right, uh, this is a 40 year compilation of all of the earthquakes in California and it gives you a, a very good picture of the areas in the state that have the highest risk uh, from earthquakes uh, that occur in the uh, bright red. Next slide. The final um, action taken following the San Fernando earthquake was the creation of an organized effort for earthquake uh, information. Uh, the, CG, the California Geological Survey was given the assignment by Governor Reagan to, to organize what was an informal organization following the San Fernando earthquake. That is the coming together of academics, of, of industry, of state agencies and federal agencies, all working together uh, to uh, both obtain all of the information necessary to keep uh, emergency service managers well informed and and so forth, uh, as well as collect scientific information so that we learn. And this this has grown to a very robust effort that is is um, is, is operational today after every major earthquake greater than a magnitude six. Next and final slide, please. Um, we've done a lot to get people ready for earthquakes, um, including uh, awareness, Great America, shake, uh, Great California Shakeout, and, and now of course, early warnings, shake alert. Next slide. This is the final slide. 
Where we really need to work though and focus our attention is, is, is getting towards rapid recovery. Um, top end computing, exascale computing allows us now to model uh, rupture to rooftop kinds of, of, of uh, modeling. Uh, these are these are going to be very significant advances in building earthquake resistant infrastructure. There are new, very inexpensive laser systems to look at interstory drift. And then the micro electrical mechanical devices are going to make sensors now make sensors very, very inexpensive so that we can greatly expand the number of sensors. So all of these um, advancements fundamentally based in science are going to help us recover more quickly from earthquakes and, and, and limit the economic damage to major earthquakes. And this is where the next big push needs to come, in, in my opinion. We've worked hard on getting people ready. Uh, we've worked hard on, 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 um, on warning, uh, early warning. And now we have to work harder in advancing our understanding of how buildings respond and being able to remotely get them back in operation without going through the laborious task of having building inspectors go to every building or every piece of infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Bolin. It's great to see that uh, the vision for what the future of the field is. Our final presentation will be from Thomas O'Rourke, Professor Emeritus at Cornell University and a recognized authority in Lifelines Earthquake Engineering. Tom. Hi, I'm Tom O'Rourke from Cornell University. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to, for me to participate in this particular uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to start with the first slide. I have five slides to present. Uh, the first one really puts the 1971 San Fernando earthquake in context. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide, it had an enormous impact on utilities and transportation systems and water storage. Uh, there's a picture of a, of a downed uh, transportation highway at an interchange, and there's also the, the failure of the lower San Fernando Dam. Uh, in the center, we have the uh, location of the water distribution system uh, for Los Angeles, surrounded by faults. There's about 30 active fault strands, each of which can cause an earthquake. And therefore, it's important for us to put the 1971 San Fernando earthquake in context in the mosaic of earthquakes that have affected this particular area. Uh, we've been affected by the 1933 Long Beach, the 1971 San Fernando, the 1994 Northridge, and, and between Long Beach and San Fernando, uh, we have approximately 38 years. Between 71 San Fernando and 1994 Northridge, we have about uh, 23 years. And so to the current time, it's about 27 years. We're, we're almost due for another major event. And of course, as the 1857 Fort Tejon earthquake indicates, uh, we're always uh, at danger or vulnerable from the San Andreas Fault, which created uh, an earthquake uh, during this particular earthquake and, and certainly affects Los Angeles in the future. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, what's quite significant about the 1971 San Fernando earthquake is it was the beginning of lifeline earthquake engineering. Uh, a professor at UCLA, C. Martin Duke, um, who was a professor there from about 1947 to 1980, uh, actually uh, championed and provided the leadership for lifeline earthquake engineering, which today looks at several different systems uh, that affect the resources and the uh, services that modern communities depend upon. They are electric power, gas and liquid fuels, telecommunications, transportation, uh, water and sewage, and some people uh, include as a separate system, flood protection. Uh, Martin was a leader and started the American Society of Civil Engineers Technical Council on Lifeline Earthquake Engineering. The initial committees were seismic criteria and risk, gas and liquid fuels, 
transportation, water and sewage, electric power and communications. Uh, this particular um, technical council has been folded currently into the Infrastructure Resilience Division uh, of ASCE. So San Fernando was really quite important in terms of providing a unique perspective through permanent ground deformation effects and transient ground deformation effects on lifelines and the start of lifeline earthquake engineering. Next slide. Uh, this slide is showing uh, some of the damages that occurred in 1971 uh, along San Fernando Road and along Glen Oaks Boulevard. If you look at this slide, you'll actually see about 13 locations of pipeline damage on San Fernando Road, about 23 on Glen Oaks Boulevard, 12 of which were explosion craters because these were gas transmission lines. Uh, and accordingly, um, if you rupture a gas line under relatively high pressure, it doesn't even have to ignite you will actually get an explosion crater. These were typically about uh, five to eight feet deep and about 30 feet wide. Next slide. And then finally, earthquakes remain with us. Uh, many of us experienced the 1994 Northridge earthquake. Again, it was a reverse fault. Uh, the 1971 San Fernando uh, was a northward dipping reverse fault that broke the surface and caused surface faulting, whereas the 1994 Northridge earthquake was a blind thrust fault dipping to the south. And, and of course, we see on the right this aerial and land view of Balboa Boulevard, which was a utility corridor. And in that utility corridor, there was about eight or nine major transmission and a number of distribution pipelines uh, you can see the houses have been burned down because of gas escaping and igniting uh, from some of the gas transmission lines in the road, uh, and also flooding uh, associated with the breakage of some of the LADWP uh, major water lines in that area. Um, there's a lot being done. I'm very proud to be part of this process. You've heard from the previous speakers, uh, many of the things that are going on to improve the resilience of the Los Angeles area. And, and I um, recommend uh, all of you to become involved as much as you can, uh, to participate, become active, uh, and to support uh, the ongoing efforts and the future um, conference that's going to be held on the San Fernando earthquake in February of 2022. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you, John. We will now move into the question and answer portion of our program. Now, please recall that you can enter questions using the QA button at the bottom of the Zoom window on your screen. Moderating this session will be the two co-chairs of the Lifelines 2021 conference. These are Craig Davis, who's, who's recently retired from LADWP and is currently a consultant on problems in earthquake and lifeline engineering. And Urtugrul Tachiroglu, professor and chair of civil and environmental engineering at UCLA. And as mentioned previously, he goes by ET. Gentlemen. Thank you, John. So I am going to basically pick up a, a few questions and maybe paraphrase them a little bit and you know, direct them to our uh, distinguished panelists. So the first question is going to be a combination uh, of two questions. Uh, one was posed by Eric Bolstad and the other one was by Zhongwen Zhen. And I apologize if I'm uh, you know, making a mistake in the pronunciation of those names, but Eric was asking how the earthquake early warning system for major earthquakes is coming along. And uh, uh, Zhongwen Zhen is asking how the earthquake early warning may help reduce damages to LADWP uh, facilities and infrastructure in particular. So let me first uh, ask uh, Steve Bolin, uh, you know, about the state of the art of the earthquake early warning system in California. And then maybe uh, Steve Cole could answer the particular utility of earthquake early warning to LADWP facilities. Thank you very much. So very briefly, the early warning system in California is building out. There are upgrades to seismometers for real-time reporting. There's work being done um, uh, by uh, UC Berkeley 
on, on the, the details of getting information collected and then distributed to cell phones and that have that done very rapidly. So these are, these are non-trivial technical issues, both knowing where people are who've signed up for the EarthShake Alert app, knowing where that cell phone is, getting the information, assessing if they are uh, in the area and then giving them that alert uh, for a given size earthquake. But progress is being made. Uh, shake alerts are going out. Um, and so, um, you know, things are moving along quite quickly. And then I guess on my side for uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, the Shake Alert Act app, um, application is, has been outstanding. Uh, DWP, we, we are uh, so appreciative to get that uh, notification. It gives us information immediately as to uh, where the earthquake has, has struck and rough magnitude uh, allows us to respond quicker and uh, knowing what the uh, potential damage might be to our various facilities. So it, it kind of identifies that in the past, we used to wait, you, you know, you'd get the, get the shake and then you'd have to turn on the TV or uh, wait for Dr. Lucy Jones to come on after a little while. So now, I mean, that, that the capability of the technology is awesome. It's really, really helpful for us in terms of our response and getting, uh, getting people out there quickly to the locations. We, we always do uh, physical checks of our, our facilities to make sure uh, that they, they have not been damaged. So the more information we get, the better off we are. So really appreciate that. Good question. Okay, thank you, uh, Steve. And Steve, uh, I'll address this next question to Professor O'Rourke. Um, I'm going to rephrase it, but the, the intent is the same. Uh, so were there any lives saved or property damages protected as a result of infrastructure changes following the 1971 earthquake, specifically thinking about the Northridge earthquake, right, which struck a similar area uh, of similar size magnitude earthquake? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, one of the really important developments in, in the last couple of years as a result of the Northridge and the 71 San Fernando earthquakes were the development, and Craig, you know about this, the, of the Seismic Resilient Water Supply Task Force. This is a combination of the Metropolitan Water District, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, and the Department, and the, and the, uh, the Department of Water Resources from, from Sacramento. And, and together, they operate most of the major water supplies of Los Angeles and Southern California, which is one of the largest uh, economic entities on earth. And, and the faulting that would occur along the San Andreas Fault can rupture all of the water supply into Southern California. And, and this really represents a first time where these major regional agencies have gotten together and have organized have uh, developed scenarios for damage and are going about uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a specific basis uh, to try to make improvements regionally uh, that would improve the response and bring water back to Los Angeles. Uh, right now, it's scheduled to come back anywhere between a year and two years, and this is going to be improved significantly by this regional group. So, so there are lots of activities that are going on. This is one of the major ones that improves the performance of lifelines on which modern communities depend. Thank you, Tom. I'd like to ask if Steve or Steve, Steve Cole or Steve Bolin would like to add anything to that. If not, uh, ET will move on to another question. I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit to it just in terms of uh, the, uh, after the 71 earthquake, we rebuilt a, a dam within a dam. Uh, we have our LA Reservoir Dam and LA Reservoir was constructed within the basin where that original dam failed and uh, was left as kind of a backup uh, facility. But the new dam was constructed with the latest technology at that time and uh, in, in the late 1970s. And that one withstood the Northridge earthquake with very minimal uh, impact to the dam itself. And uh, so it's just, to me, it's uh, engineering and being applied and, and lessons being learned from that earthquake to, to minimize uh, future, future problems and, and future threats to lives and all that. So, so the, the, the huge potential threat to the lives downstream of that dam 
uh, were eliminated in uh, the Northridge earthquake. I will simply add that there were, there's no question that lives were saved because hospitals were more resilient um, and, and, the, and attention, much more attention had been given to seismic retrofitting of unreinforced uh, masonry buildings. And so there's, there's just simply no question that actions taken in immediately following the San Fernando earthquake had a major impact on the resilience of structures um, uh, in, for the Northridge earthquake and of course beyond. Uh, there are quite a number of uh, great questions coming along from our uh, Q&A tab, but unfortunately, we'll probably run out of time. Uh, so the next question is by Daphne Markian. Um, uh, Daphne's asking, did the number of leaks and breaks to the water distribution system align with the expected results using the American Lifelines Alliance approach? I think, uh, you know, we can just answer this question for the 1971 uh, earthquake and 1994 Northridge, perhaps. I'd like to pose this question first to Professor O'Rourke, and then maybe Steve Cole can make comments on it too. Yes, I, I'd, some of the statistics actually were taken from the ALA report and, and incorporated from the Northridge earthquake. Um, um, but the Northridge earthquake provided its own data set, which was extraordinarily important with respect to two factors. Number one, it told us how the entire system, which is one of the largest water supplies on earth, responded to transient ground deformation. So it gave us real statistics in response to seismic transitory movement, but it also told us permanent ground deformation. There's at least five different locations, many of which are, some of which are in the upper San Fernando Valley and the liquefaction and the landslides and the ground lurching there uh, provided lots of good information about how those types of permanent ground deformation sources uh, influence and affect uh, pipelines that carry uh, water. Yeah, not, not adding to that, I think we, we learned a great deal and uh, Dr. Davis and I actually had an opportunity to work together on uh, some lessons learned from uh, both the 71 earthquake and then um, the, uh, the Northridge earthquake in some cases we saw similar damage in similar locations, and uh, Dr. Davis was able to uh, come up with a, a program or a new uh, tunnel that essentially went around uh, an area in which uh, a graben was forming and uh, was able to, to mitigate something that we saw both in the 71 earthquake and then again in the uh, Northridge earthquake. So each one of these is a lesson, and, and you learn stuff, as, as uh, Dr. O'Rourke said, and uh, very, very valuable. And, and then we learn how to mitigate and how to uh, improve our, our system and resiliency. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve and, and Tom. We, we have uh, one minute left. So I want to uh, pose a question to Steve Bolin. Um, you alluded and referenced things on um, uh, uh, smart monitoring. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. Uh, already Caltech has uh, partnered with the Unified uh, LA Unified School District and has these MEMS sensors, these microelectrical mechanical devices, accelerometers, which are very inexpensive and uh, are doing experiments and, and, and evaluating them for, uh, for, for routine use. So the, the vision, you know, it's really the smart buildings vision where we instrument buildings to the extent that we, we understand exactly how they behave through an earthquake event and understand whether any design limits were, were exceeded and, and, and clear those buildings for, for reuse and occupancy immediately following. And if you can imagine that for all critical infrastructure, uh, all essential buildings, um, having the information to deploy your scarce uh, emergency services uh, uh, um, capabilities in a more accurate way, um, you, can, you can really uh, respond more effectively to an earthquake and, and get, get, get things rolling again, literally and figuratively in terms of bridges and roads, buildings and so forth. So that's a view of the future. Uh, it's not here yet. The technology is advancing. Uh, it will go hand in glove with advanced computing uh, uh, simulations uh, that will also help. Um, but those are things that are coming and, and, and as I said, really important for um, 
how we how we recover more quickly from an earthquake, which is which is which is economically uh, a, a critical piece. Yep, and our our site at DWP, we're, we've got a program right now, uh, essentially uh, adding additional sensors and technology essentially for uh, continuing to be able to provide real-time or near real-time updates in terms of dam stability and uh, what we're seeing in the dam itself, whether that's uh, well, a combination of well reads, turbidity at the, uh, as the water is seeping out in the seepage vault, um, cameras to uh, be able to instantly evaluate or take a look at visually the dam, uh, automated, uh, automated survey equipment that can do um, uh, movement and settlement checks. So there's there's a variety of new uh, technologies that we're working at uh, at DWP to try and get a, a real quick handle on what's going on with our dam immediately following an earthquake, and to be able to evaluate it. And then, as uh, Steve Bolin mentioned, trying to use uh, some some artificial intelligence or uh, data analytics to be able to convert that information into uh, something that's actionable uh, during a crisis. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve Cole and Steve Bolin. Uh, our time is now up. So this concludes our webinar on the 50 year commemoration of the San Fernando earthquake. We thank the UCLA Simule School of Engineering for hosting this event and the speakers and the audience for participating. We will follow up individually on those uh, questions that are submitted. There were several that we did not have a chance to get to. So uh, we will address those uh, after the event. And please stay tuned for more conference activities in 2021 and also plan to attend the conference uh, one year from now at uh, UCLA. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and goodbye. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.